very much. Thank you very much indeed. Can I be heard? Marvellous. Well, it's wonderful to be back as a guest a mere month after being an exploited uh, worker. Um, but a very pleasurable exploitation it was. So, just to say, actually, most of the captions are on the lower part of the screen. Can everyone see the captions? Or do I need to read them out as we go along? Okay. Sorry? Yes, yes, let's... Yes, I'll read them along. Okay, so, Walter Richard Sickert, Variation on Peggy, 1934-5, to five, in a private collection. Looking prettier on my screen than yours, but we won't make this an evening about JPEGs, I promise. So, um, yes, I made this my desktop image the other day, so at home, it was Lillian Tomasco for, for, for several months, but um, I'm afraid she gave way to Peggy. And so just as I was, woke up this morning and looked at Peggy on my desktop, I then had an email from an old intern at Art Critical asking if I would write a reference for her. She wants to go and be an intern at the Guggenheim in Venice. And this is not Peggy Guggenheim, this is Peggy Ashcroft, but the synchronicity was enough to cinch the deal. Or clinch the deal, do you? Clinch or cinch a deal? Anyway, clinch, yes, clinch. It was a cinch, and it clinched the deal. <laughs> and um, she's a wonderful intern. Anyway, she, I hope she doesn't spend her whole life being interns, but she will go to the La Serenissima care of Sickert. So, um, it was to have been the perfect storm. Luke Toyman's lectures on Thursday evening. Lillian Tomasco opens on Friday evening, and a lecture I've been conspiring with the school to give here for some years on Sickert happens the following Tuesday. Perfect storm because one of my interests in Sickert is in his uncanny contemporaneity. And I think there's no one who quite epitomizes Sickert reincarnated than the Belgian Luke Toymans, who alas didn't make it Thursday. But he was on the schedule, so I think the storm is perfect enough. Um, Sickert, the juvenile lead, 1908 on the left. Luke Toyman's The Riding 2010, a painting in his current show at David Zwerner Gallery, which opened just last week. At the opening, I was able to uh, have a pleasant exchange with Mr. Toyman's and uh, popped the question, does he know and like Sickert? <laughs> yes, definitely, he said. Very, very, he discovered him late. He was at some... Well, he doesn't look like a man who's ever at pains, but he was able to point out. Uh, he discovered him quite late, but it was a pleasurable discovery, uh, an affinity, obviously. And uh, uh, what he admires in Sickert is a certain roughness, he said. A certain, I don't think it was a roughness. There was a better word he used. Harshness, that's it. Yes, he said, he likes him, he's very harsh. And I think that's it with Sickert, in a way. He, he's a harsh fellow, as you see on the left in that self-portrait. This was not the self-portrait that Patricia Cornwell looked at and had an epiphany, deciding simply on seeing a reproduction of a Sickert portrait in a book, that he was Jack the Ripper, and then setting off, off after that a visual epiphany to find the evidence to back up her claim. But another thing about Sickert that we'll discover this evening is an abiding sentimentality. 
And to be harsh and sentimental may seem oxymoronic, but I think that's actually, I'm, I'm coming to feel that that's the essence of the man and the explanation for his contemporary appeal to a roster of artists whose work interests me, whose work interests me inherently, but whose work interests me all the more for putting me in mind of Sickert. So, usually you talk about sweet and sentimental, or you talk about being tough and unsentimental. To be tough and sentimental is a rare combination of, of, of temperaments, but I think, I think we get it in Sickert. Perfect storm, as I say, because also um, Lillian Tomasco downstairs. Tomasco is a painter um, whose austere tonalism relates to a formal legacy, especially of the early paintings, or shall we say the earlier paintings of, of Sickert. I th when I wrote about Tomasco, the historic touchstones that I mentioned uh, were not uh, Sickert, but artists like Gwen John, bottom left, and Wilhelm Hammershoy, bottom right. Um, artists of intenseness, intense interiority, a kind of washed out palette, but washed out that forces you to look more closely and discover nuances of tone rather than uh, dwelling on chroma, the other side of the coin of color, as it were. And that, for me, is, um, is, a, is a sort of historic clue to where uh, Lillian Tomasco is coming from. But it probably is another of those vindications of why I'm strongly drawn to her paintings, that they also put me in mind of Sickert. This is not Sickert. This, this is André Durin, whose Harlequin and, and Pierrot is of 1924 is on view um, uptown at the, in the Chaos and Classicism exhibition at the Guggenheim. I just want to state, without dwelling on it, that in my mind, for reasons that could be adumbrated but actually aren't that crucial, because what's really crucial is that they're in my mind, in my mind, this lecture on Sickert and a lecture I'd like to give some other day on Durin are a sort of diptych. They are a pendant to each other, uh, principally because these are my... Um, I seem to adopt artists to become obsessed and infatuated by within art history who've been done down for some reason, usually to do with supposedly going off the rails in their late work. Um, and I think that is principally what links Durin and Sickert beyond the fact that's of no real consequence to anybody else than me, than that I'm incredibly privileged to have small works by each of them hanging at home. So they are interests in that other sense as well. Um, but, yeah, Durin, early Fauve stuff in the canon, indisputably there. When you talk about the Fauves, you talk about Durin in the same breath as Matisse and Braque. But even though he was an artist for the rest of his career, at least until its unfortunate turns during the Second World War, who was spoken of in the same breath as Picasso and Matisse as leaders of the avant-garde in France has really kind of fallen out of favor and is seen now as a sort of marginal and maverick figure. Sickert's uh, fate is not quite so extreme, um, uh, but on the other hand, he didn't start as high as Durin, so he didn't have as far to fall, but in fact, he's not really fallen in that, yes, he was in trouble, uh, reputation-wise, at the time of his death, because those people who were most uh, admiring of classic paintings like this one, of St. Mark's Venice from the 1890s in the Tate collection, or this beauty, uh, the old Bedford 
one of his uh, series of uh, classic series of uh, music hall subjects where he painted not only the characters on stage but as tellingly and as revealingly the um, audience people who championed this as the best modern art that Britain could offer, uh, found this to be a horrible falling away. These late paintings, uh, mostly derived from illustrations and photographs, worked in a strangely rough, open brushwork and deploying, uh, betraying the, the, the tonal beauty of, uh, of his earlier work uh, with a strange kind of high-keyed chroma. Um, that looked so unlike him. And as Wendy Barron, the principal authority on Sickert, uh, points out in a very important exhibition catalogue, Late Sickert, a show that really revolutionised the way the art world thought about the late works, by which I mean, let's bear in mind, he's born in 1860, dies in 1942. We're talking about work from the mid-20s, about 1926, when he enters his third marriage until his death in Bath in 42. Um, th these, um, these late works were rehabilitated in a way that some of us feel the late works, which means 80% of the works of André Durand also need to be looked at afresh. As I say, uh, the personal interest for me uh, of Sickert, Sickert I have like different layers of interest in, but sort of almost first and foremost is that I once just saw and was utterly besotted by a painting in an art fair, the painting on the right. My father had entrusted me with a very early Patrick Heron painting to dispose of in the market. And uh, these are family secrets, don't write them down, don't quote them. And he very generously let me, well, we'll do some little, never mind about the financial details, but he let me take possession of it and trade it, a straight swap, no money involved, with a, a dealer friend who had purchased this late Sickert. So a curious cultural moment in a way, very footnote to a footnote to a footnote cultural moment, that you got a very early Patrick Heron, don't have a JPEG of it, but Patrick Heron known for his beautiful effulgent, deep saturated color abstraction, had done this rather murky early Bloomsbury painting as a student in the 30s, uh, in the 40s, and that was done as a straight swap for one of these discredited late, strange, from a photograph, sick at paintings from the early 30s. And it began in my own m modest um, eccentric collection, the beginnings of um, an interest in paintings that have to do with actresses and infatuations. Um, I went out and finally got William Nicholson's Sarah Bernhardt to go with it. And um, in my mind's eye, they sit very much also with works of Duncan Hanna uh, on the left, his Nova Pillbeam um, from what date? 2002. 2002. I'm reliably informed by a member of the audience. <laughs> And as I say, on the right, Gwen Franson Davis, um, Welsh actress, uh, Gwen Franson Davis as Elizabeth Barrett Browning, circa 1934, private collection, New York. Um, yes, so Pillbeam, so Hannah, yes, my friendship and admiration for the work of Duncan Hannah stems from Sickert because um, I wrote a piece ridiculing and I hope demolishing the Jack the Ripper theory of Patricia Cornwall in Slate magazine, and I was sought out by a sickertophile whose, whose work I knew, of course, Duncan Hanna, and a beautiful friendship ensued. We go out murdering prostitutes every Thursday. <laughs> Here's Nova Sleeping from 2005. The sinister shadow there on the wall, care of Hitchcock. Nova is a sort of like, like Sickert and Durant. Nova is this 
great beauty extracted from obscurity and deified in the work of Hannah. Young, uh, Love's Young Dream, also from 2005 by Hannah. Hannah's um, attractions to Sickert uh, meld with his um, anglophilia, his um, wistful sense of both involvement and alienation from imagery via the mechanics of reproduction and the discovery, the rediscovery of, of reproduced mediated imagery in the process of paint. All things which are very apropos of late Sickert. Here's Walter Richard Sickert's Claude Philip Martin, 1935. So you see a certain, obviously, structural kinship with the Hannah in that we've got uh, adolescents dangling their legs over walls. But um, as I think we'll discover in the course of the evening, I hope there are um, more structural affinities than that. Notice that his name is Walter Richard Sickert. Um, Wendy Barron, in that late Sickert catalogue I was beginning to tell you, uh, says, points out that when he enters his third marriage with Therese Lesore in 1926, he does what's typically eccentric and curious for him as uh, an artist who's uh, started, as somebody said, started life as an actor and was always a poseur, uh, changed his forename and uh, having been known as Walter uh, for all of his successful uh, career, became Richard, uh, insisted on being called Richard, his other name in, in his uh, last decades, thus initiating a sense of there being like two artists, Walter Sickert, admired and beloved for his music hall scenes and his, uh, his, his Camden Town murder series and his, his paintings of low-life subjects, and Richard, the eccentric gentleman who went off the rails painting from photographs and illustrations in, in his late life. So you could like Walter and leave Richard. Um, and what, what, what has happened subsequently is that there are now people who, who care for Richard but can, don't have to bother with Walter. Um, and I'm, I'm for Walter Richard Sickert. So this lecture is definitely about Walter Richard Sickert. Uh, one, one individual, unified career, let's see. Well, on the left we have Walter uh, Richard Sickert, George Moore from 1890, a painting in the Tate, and on the right um, a self-portrait by James Abbott McNeil Whistler from the 1850s in the Freer in Washington, D.C. Um, Sickert served, uh, as I say, started his life as, a, as a, an actor, um, uh, went on tour with uh, um, Henry Irving's company, and uh, uh, then switched vocation to want to become a painter. And um, he did enter uh, the formal academies, but um, principally he was apprenticed to, Sick to, to Whistler. And Whistler uh, actually on Whistler's insistence, Sickert signed his early canvases, um, a student of Whistler. Um, and I think, I think what's important for us is that the people who I am setting up as apprentices of Sickert are not obliged to sign their work an apprentice of Sickert. They're not actually even obliged to look like Sickert. In the case of uh, Toymans, they're not even obliged to know about Sickert till late in their life. In the case of, say, Elizabeth Payton, maybe they don't even have to have heard of Sickert. They, uh, are, they are apprentices of Sickert in my imagination. Now this begs a kind of question, oh, just to just to look at something with a bit more colour and, and beauty in it. Um, Degas' Miss La La at the Cirque Fernando from 1879 in the National Gallery in London and Sickert's Minnie Cunningham at the Old Bedford of 1892 in the Tate. Um, it was through his uh, friendship and apprenticeship to Whistler, actually carrying a painting of Whistler's, in fact, in fact, 
the, the portrait of his mother, I think. He had to take that to the Salon in Paris, had letters of introduction, uh, met Degas, and formed a great and lifelong friendship. And the debt to Degas, of course, is exponentially more substantial in Sickert's case than the debt to Whistler. Um, and uh, whose, whose own debt to Degas is not insignificant. Um, yeah, what does it mean to worry about the contemporaneity, though, of an artist you love and admire? Um, this, is, this is a question that uh, I tease myself with because um, Sickert, Sickert is outside of my area of expertise, my subject, which is contemporary art. It's just a personal obsession, a, a love for this artist. He's a significant artist. If you go to Britain, people really know him. Um, and uh, if you go outside Britain, painters sometimes know him. He is um, a petit major. He is, he's sort of second, third league. And, um, you know, I remember once talking to somebody who was an obsessed um, expert on the work of Thomas Hart Benton, and um, I, I said to him, you know, yeah, it's very, very interesting to see how close he is, to, how, how, how deep his debt is to El Greco and his murals. And this fellow said, yes, but he's so much better than El Greco. Um, I, I don't feel any need to say that Sickert is better than Degas. I certainly, by the way, think he's better than Whistler, but that's another problem. Um, I don't feel he's... I don't feel you have to say that if some artist who's second league been overlooked is a great hero of yours, you don't have to say, and he's better than anyone else. It's okay to be second league. But the other thing is contemporaneity. So why does it matter so much to be seen to be contemporary? Well, I think if you're a painter and you adopt a dead, slightly obscure painter as, as your man, um, you need to sort of show how it's not just some personal whim of yours that you happen to like this person, but if, say, you are Fairfield Porter saying, Vuillard is just as important to me as um, Cezanne, why can't modern art start with Vuillard, then you show that Vuillard is very contemporary, it has the potential to be contemporary in order to justify the eccentricity of your elective affinity. Um, so, but with me, because I'm not a painter, I'm just a critic of contemporary art who then, as it were, takes a vacation from my vocation to look at and have fun with and enjoy an artist from the past, it's then it's fine. It could, should be fine just to leave him in the past, to enjoy, in fact, the, the periodicity, the, the pastness. And, and in fact, you know, if one was real scholars, don't have to go to people of the past only if they look contemporary. You go to them to see what they tell you about a period of the past. And Sickert can tell you a tremendous amount about... Uh, entertainment in London in the 1890s from the painting on the right of this sort of child actress in the music hall. Um, but I find myself very, very drawn to actually saying to people, hey, look at Sickert because Sickert, who gets going in the 1890s, apparently goes off the rails in the 1920s, dies in the 1940s, he is very relevant, he is very contemporary. He looks just like Toymans, therefore he's better than if he didn't look like Toymans, he just looked like a painter who died in 1942. So I tease myself, why does that matter? But yet somehow it does. Perhaps it's the bridge between my uh, uh, personal infatuation with Sickert and my duty as a commentator on the present, and perhaps also as a desire to, to have others look at and value and appreciate Sickert, that a way to do it is to say, gosh, he's very contemporary. Another thing that does interest me, however, is, is um, having, as it were, become an American uh, in the Steiner sense, in the Stein sense, that um, 
one thing that really, really struck me very forcibly, and I, I had this fantasy. When I first came here at the school, I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to do a Sickert Hopper exhibition. I think I even r rashly put it in the program at some point, and then had lunches with Robert Rosenblum, the late lamented, great Sickert enthusiast, R Robert Rosenblum, and... Um, talked about it and he said oh yeah but don't, don't stop with don't stop with um, Hopper he said what about Duncan Hannah and uh, so I said yes we'll get Duncan Hannah in as well so we'll, but of course uh, the wonderful gallery downstairs which has boasted shows of Picasso and Goya and Matisse's students is nonetheless an art school gallery and is probably not the place to gather hoppers and sickets and I'm not sure the world necessarily wants to but I did want to, and um, to my pleasure, genuine pleasure, scholarly pleasure, of course, slight jealousy, um, a, a colleague by the name of David Fraser Jenkins, who's a great expert on Sickert in England, former curator at the Tate, wrote a, a marvellous paper on the very subject of how um, certain British, how Hopper looks very much to and like certain um, contemporaneous British painters, he lists, he, he goes into Gwen John, who we mentioned earlier in relation to Tomasco, um, and one or two others, Camden Town Group, um, but definitely, definitely Sickert. Sickert and Hopper, Hopper could certainly have seen works of Sickert's at uh, galleries, um, at Lord Bernard Gallery in, uh, in Paris uh, in the first years of the 20th century. Uh, Sickert's, you know, obviously about 10, 20 years older than um, Hopper. Um, but what we have is a very strong affinity, I think, in that we have in um, Sickert and Hopper two uh, modern painters who are not um, modernist in the sense of joining in the um, futurist, cubist um, journey towards the deconstruction of visual language, preferring instead, in fact, to revi revivify a kind of essentially Renaissance language of, uh, of the, the, you know, the, the, well, you know, old master Renaissance language, but um, proving their modernity by their tapping into and fully and richly understanding the conditions of modernity. So that um, um, particularly the melancholy of the city, a sense of alienation, um, uh, and, and, the, and the sense of alienation that urban experience engenders, without getting sociological or heavy about it, but just understanding it in a very rich pictorial way is something that I think um, unites a painting like Walter Sickert's Ennui, uh, Boredom, circa 1914 in the Tate, and um, Hopper's uh, Office at Night um, uh, for 1940 at the uh, Walker Art Center in uh, Duncan Hannah's birth town of Minneapolis. I think enough of Duncan Hannah, if you don't mind. but. Um, I just noticed and thought I'd mention that, but more to the point, well, there's a little sexual chemistry between the secretary at the filing cabinet and the, well, not between, but towards the boss, um, uh, uh, absorbed in his figures, but uh, whereas, but to, uh, whereas the gaze of the bored housewife on the left is, um, is, is towards either the um, bird in, stuffed in the... Um, uh, vitrine or the figure of one of the um, prints on the wall, uh, whereas the gentleman is lost in a kind of Italo Svevo like reverie with his uh, tobacco and his pint of uh, bass. Um, but uh, yes, there is, there is the ennui and a little more glory, if ennui can have glory. Um, 
women absorbed in their work and lost in reverie at the same time, Hopper's East Side Interior, an etching from 22, and Sickert, uh, the rasher, um, this woman frying her bacon um, of, in fact, the same period, 1920 to 22, also an etching. That's a very doable show, by the way, if anyone's looking for shows to put, put on and impress the world with, with their originality. We won't tell you it comes from me. Do a show of Hopper and Sickert etchings. I think it will be a very rare and illuminating treat. Hopper's Night Shadows from 21 and Sickert's Pimlico on the right from 1915. So the grime of the city not just the grime of the city, but also the sensationalism of news uh, is, is what really is where Hopper found his great subjects, at, at certainly at one period. As I say, the music hall, that dipping into the low, that, that aspect of the low life of, of modern living uh, was one thing, but he truly becomes, as it were, a painter of modern life when he makes contemporary history paintings not out of a subject like the arrival of Catherine de' Medici in, in, in the court of Henri Cart, but uh, a, a, a squalid murder that takes place in Camden Town, uh, a working class district of London that after a period of, in Dieppe in France he returned to uh, in the early years of the century and kept studios there and formed associations with young progressive painters who became known as the Camden Town Group. Now, um, to the, uh, to the inconvenience of conspiracy theorists and ripperologists, uh, many of the images which are seen as prima facie evidence that uh, uh, Sickert, when he wasn't painting, was running around town slashing prostitutes, uh, these paintings like uh, the Camden Town Murder, often have subtitles like, what should we do for rent? Uh, meaning, in other words, that um, uh, like many artists, he would make an image, he would give it a title that fixes it in, in the mind with one very specific event, and um, then actually see it as being just as much about quite a different subject that's got nothing really to do with that at all. And then he'd have some painting just of uh, sad, despondent lovers, some post-coital situation, um, or indeed somebody who is worried about the rent. And if, if that, in its gloom, me interior um, fits in with the theme of the Camden Town murder, then he can send it into one show called What Should We Do About the Rent? And he'll send it into another show and he'll call it The Camden Town Murder. So, uh, yes, this is not Sickard. This has no caption. Uh, I forgot to put a caption on it, but it is a work from the 1960s of. 70s of R.B. Kitai. Um, and it's an affinity with Kitai, who was an artist I was really interested in before I got interested in Sickert, that, that helped me realize that this um, very strong theme in both artists, the attraction to um, what Kitai quotes Flaubert as calling the undertaste, this um, interest in the, 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 the squalor and glamour of um, prostitution, um, uh, illicit sex in the city, anonymous sex, uh, and sexual crime coming out of all of that, uh, which gives a kind of pungency to um, gritty paintings about modernity and, and the alienations of modern life. Um, a certain, yes, a prurience, and, and there are narratives that go with it. So um, I, I see, as I, as I say, this can be Camden Town Murder or What Should We Do About the Rent? It's a painting from 1908 in the Yale Center for British Art. Uh, I said I'd leave him alone, but Duncan, do you know the title of this painting of Sickerts? No. No. Okay. Um, here is a late Sickert, Hubby, 36 to 38. Um, we are desk in its interior, but Degas-like in that sort of muscularity of the figures, but also constantly intimating narrative, a story, uh, violating the strictures of the formalist, uh, of the Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury formalists like Bell and Fry, with whom he had a kind of love-hate relationship. Um, 
And so similarly, uh, Kitai, uh, Stamos the Greek, Kitai, communist and socialist, Sikert, Lely de Fer, the Iron Bed from 1905. Yes, they've got a nice little cache of these Camden Town paintings because of a wonderful show that took place uh, recently at the Courtauld Institute Galleries that brought together all of this series, including Mornington Crescent Nude from 1907. Clearly, it's not a voluptuous uh, Venus, uh, even a contemporary Olympia, it's, um, but it isn't nonetheless necessarily um, a murder victim. It could just be somebody who's dead tired. It doesn't have to be dead. And this is, this is, I think, the masterpiece from that series, and one of his most significant paintings, um, uh, La Hollandaise from 1906 in the Tate. Um, a very curious painting. Um, you, well, well, I hope you can see it. I hope it looks better from, from where you're sitting than where I'm standing. Um, but can you, can you see the mouse as it comes across? Yes. Um, the, the face is this um, very strangely put together thing. There you go, our mouse. Um, you, it can be read different ways. These could be eyes and nose, or it could be quite distinct that these are actually brows, and that the, if you look at the scale of it, the, the uh, eyes are here and here, and the nose is there, so she's actually looking down. So, um, hard, hard to read, um, but also um, very much it's like poised between um, uh, the, the erotic and the fanatic between uh, uh, eros and thanatos, between, um, between something quite uh, alluring and sexual in that sort of way that her thigh uh, moves across the, the picture surface, but, but also um, very discomforting, and it's very much an alienated, squalid sense of um, the nude in an interior. And you can see, obviously, a touchstone for Bacon, um, um, who Bacon also um, deriving uh, not inspiration or succor, but a certain validity as well, working in his works from photographs rather than drawings from life, um, and yet giving something very kind of vital and present, um, is, 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 uh, is the example of Sickert, an artist who was a consummate draftsman. Um, I, I regretted this lecture as I didn't bring JPEGs of uh, Sickert drawings. That's for another lecture. Uh, certainly could be a lecture in itself. But a, a consummate draftsman who, in his later work, as it were, Walter was a consummate draftsman, Richard, stopped drawing and painted direct using uh, photography and illustration as his source materials instead, as his means of drawing, as it were, um, appropriation rather than observation, but after a lifetime, or half a lifetime at least, of very, sustain, very sustained direct observation through drawing. So. Um, the School of London painters, this is Auerbach, who uh, occupies a studio once occupied by Kossoff in Mornington Crescent, uh, which is just next to a statue of William Cobbett, who was a great British liberal reformer and the first, and the first father-in-law of Sickert. Um, the connections, don't worry, are a little more substantial than that. Um, that uh, Auerbach and Bacon and Freud, the School of London painters, as Kitai first called them, um, were crucially involved in uh, the rehabilitation of the late work of Sickert. Um, Auerbach wrote a very poignant uh, preface to the catalogue of late Sickert at the Hayward Gallery, in which he said, um, you know, it's a, it's a hallmark, both of very good art and very bad art, that it's shameless, and that uh, the, the, the late works of um, Sickert that have been sort of dismissed as uh, squeaks, in the word of uh, Clive Bell, um, 
or just uh, uh, rather in the way that late Picasso was written off by some of his great enthusiasts like Douglas Cooper, uh, that um, it, it fell to painters to say, no, let's look again at the almost willfully perverse late works and find in those uh, what Auerbach in a wonderful phrase calls grand, quirky and living forms. When I came to write an essay on the School of London painters, I gave it that title. Oh, uh, forget the Corbet on the left, um, or enjoy the Corbet on the left, but it's got nothing to do with this, which is uh, obviously um, the, the affinities of Freud are in many directions and places, but um, the, uh, the alienated uh, nude poise between uh, the the erotic and the casual or sort of non erotic uh, the, the, the voyeur the the, the the position it puts the viewer in of of, of uh, voyeurism um, is something especially with a, a beaten up couch in a murky interior that unites uh, many of the works of Freud with those of Walter Sickert so Sickert becomes for the school of London artists. On the right is a painting called A Servant of Abraham by Sickert, and on the left is a self-portrait, as is the Sickert, incidentally, by David Bomberg called um, Hero Israel, um, in which, uh, actually that's not the title of the Bomberg, sorry, but yes it is, yes, it's Hero Israel, um, so it's a biblical theme between those two paintings. Uh, Bomberg served a kind of informal apprenticeship with Sickert, much the way that Sickert had with Whistler. And so Bomberg's students, like Auerbach and Kossoff, were able to draw um, a genealogy for themselves through uh, Bomberg, who they studied with informally at a place called the Borough Polytechnic in the 1950s, to Sickert, to Whistler slash Degas, and through Degas right back to Angra, and as someone else has shown, right back from Angra through to Raphael. So in other words, you, it's the game we all, what painters love to play, of saying, well, I studied with so-and-so in Philadelphia, who once had coffee with Graham Nixon, who went to Camberwell, where he was a student of Auerbach, who was a student of... Bomberg was a student of Sickert. Blah, blah, blah. So every artist can somehow put themselves on that great glorious road back to Raphael um, through that sort of, this one was taught by that one. But uh, so Sickert becomes a sort of grand old man in a way, posthumously through the School of London. Um, and that, here's the painting in uh, more glory. It's in the Tate. It's from 1929. And incidentally, the painting is about um, the crisis of the, the crisis of succession. Um, but, you know, the, the curious thing about Sickert um, uh, is that he, he's a he's a modern and experimental painter and a maverick painter, but he's um, a modern who's kind of anti-modernist in that he's. Uh, Sure, he was modern as modern could be as he sets out, because he's looking at, uh, he's a student of Whistler and he's looking at uh, uh, Degas and people. But as, uh, as Roger Fry ups the ante for modernism in Britain by uh, his organizing his show of the post impressionists, as Cezanne is introduced to, to, to the British scene, as uh, vorticism takes British modernism in, in a sort of futurist and experimental direction. Um, Sickert, once the rebel, is now a sort of old man, sort of left out of things somewhat. And he's a, a very prolific and satirical and um, eccentric but penetrating writer and critic who um, stands out as, as, as a, a berator of, of modernism um, and um, certainly has no time or sympathy for Cezanne and, and, and is uh, fiercely antagonistic towards formalism. So um, this puts him in bad odor with a sort of mid-century modernist and makes him potentially rather interesting to a later in the century postmodernist. So I think that's in a way 
um, something to bear in mind. But um, the servant of Abraham, the, the subject is biblical. He, it's, it's Eliezer who's sent by Abraham to find the spouse for um, Isaac. And he finds Rebecca at a well, and you know the story, of course. Um, the point is, why is he presenting himself? He's ever the poser, as Wendy Barron says, but why is he presenting himself as, as this servant of Abraham in the sense? Partly because of his sense of his responsibility, that the great line from the old masters through Degas, through himself, this way of painting, of creating structure through narrative, um, is in jeopardy. How is it going to be passed on? So for the School of London painters, they're, they're, they, they derive great succor from believing that they are of the chosen seed, as it were, through Bomberg, through Sickert, the sort of, they are, uh, they are Jacob to their Isaac and Abraham. Um, this this self-portrait belongs to one of several self-portraits from late in life, which are a kind of poignant um, and at the same time slightly comic, and at the same time formally very, very exciting, interesting paintings about um, it's called Home Life, 1937, the rather portly Sickert scene retrieving some beverages from the cellar. So, um, so within British art, Sickert, uh, not just School of London, but prior to that, in fact, really the rehabilitation of late, um, late Sickert goes back to the critics Andrew Forge and David Sylvester, who brought out, brought attention to the late work of Sickert as being uh, very fresh and very modern in the 1950s and 60s, um, and then relating to somebody like John Bratby, who's uh, uh, championed by uh, uh, John Berger, but uh, also written about by David Sylvester, who talks about them he, in a famous review. He said, they give us everything but the kitchen sink. And so they became known as the kitchen sink painters. And that directly brings us to mind from that a famous quote of uh, uh, Sickert, where he's, he exhorts people to, he exhorts painters to, uh, to consider that uh, painting belongs in the, in the scullery, not in the, um, the salon or the drawing room. Uh, he says that painters shouldn't uh, concern themselves with grandiose subjects, but should actually uh, really get to terms with uh, what he calls gross material facts. And so that um, uh, sort of recipe for squalor, as it were, picked up by this sort of proto-pop new realist painters like the kitchen sink. <coughs> but Sickert also becomes the touchstone for um, a rather austere, some would say slightly drab academic uh, uh, figure painting in Britain. And so in a way that rather hinders a discovery for younger artists in Britain of Sickert that, you know, you get Sickert clobbered over you, ironically with Cezanne, who Sickert so despised, but Cezanne plus Sickert becomes the official recipe in the 1950s and 60s in art schools like the Slade and places strongly influenced by the Euston Road School, uh, a milieu out of which people like you and Uglo emerged. Um, uh, and that comes across in paintings like this one by Sir William Coldstream, but also um, a more Sickert-like in its weirdness uh, painter who went back and forth between figuration and abstraction, uh, Victor Pasmore. This is his nude from 1941. So, let me identify then what I think are the strong claims that Sickert can have to be considered contemporary. If we wanted to pull a stunt and take some late paintings by Sickert and hope that no one in America has heard of Sickert and just say, here is an artist, a new artist we should look at. He's very contemporary don't you think? I think the first gallery we should try for this new artist is David's Werner because 
this guy Sickert will hang very well with Marlene Dumas and Luke Toymans and Neo Rausch. Perhaps, perhaps this Sickert is influenced by those artists. So here is a portrait of Audrey, Aubrey Beardsley from 1894 uh, with Luke Toyman's speech and his current show. Not going to make strong demands for one relating to the other. They are simply portraits of solitary male figures standing and casting shadows, which is, of course, not unique to any one painter or period. But... This is a, a painting, which I'm sure you can barely see, called uh, Gallery of the Old Mogul, 1906. Sickert, Sickert liked to push to extremes certain f concerns of facture without becoming a formalist or an abstractionist. Um, and this, this infatuation with tone, this, this interest in building up a slow read painting that gives a convincing sense of interior light um, uh, that you get in this sort of painting of the darkened gallery of uh, uh, the the the, the uh, hu it's the gods as it were the highest uh, and therefore the cheapest uh, seating section of a musical theatre with people who actually you might be able to see even able to hold the rafters. This, 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 these chaps can actually hold the ceiling in order to then... Can you see it at all? Is it legible? No, that's not bother then. Um, come and look at the PowerPoint afterwards if you like. I'm on the screen. Um, so, as I say, Sickert, having been this consummate draftsman, puts aside drawing as a tool and uh, embraces direct painting from found photographic sources. He, um, he liked, actually, and commissioned portraits to send a portrait photographer, a professional, not himself, He'd hire a professional to go around to the person who'd commissioned a portrait, take their photograph, and then he would work from that photograph to construct the, the painting. And this was a clear violation of taboos of the Academy, um, the Royal Academy as an organization he was in and out of as a member. Um, and um, uh, you know, it goes back to those anxieties about photography expressed by the Salon and the academies in the, uh, around the time of the invention of the medium in the, in the mid-19th century. Um, he said, Sickert said, uh, it was, uh, and this is uh, obviously something that stands him well apart from the School of London emulators. He said uh, that it's uh, cruel and inhumane to have somebody sit for more than half an hour, um, advice that wasn't imparted to Lucian Freud or uh, Frank Auerbach, um, many of whose sitters have to commit for months, if not years, to the process of being painted. So here's a sort of snapshot of uh, King George with his uh, riding instructor, um, not riding instructor, his, 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 man his horse manager. He's obviously hearing some tips on the track as to what's going on with his horses and everybody else's. Um, and it gives rise to this, uh, this strange but compelling image um, where it's doesn't lose its sense that it's based in a quotidian appropriated snapshot, but it achieves something very plastic and pictorial through paint, through transformation. And this is what's, uh, and, and also a weird kind of abstraction, as well as being, you know, a compelling narrative. Um, and so this sense of, of taking the snapshot, taking, taking, what's a, taking a snapshot from uh, a newspaper and, uh, um, and making a kind of iconic plastic painterly presence out of that um, image is, is something that relates late Sickert very closely to Toyman's practice, the Secretary of State, 2005. And also, of course, to Kitai himself. This is R.B. Kitai's Unity Mitford, 1968. Kitai, I won't, won't go into Kitai now, but uh, 
an exquisite and tantalizing and irritating all at once image, uh, creating a sort of similar aesthetic to we're not supposed to mention him again, but Duncan Hannah's um, 1920s, 30s sort of infatuation images of, of, of characters like Nova Pilbeam, um, that sort of clipped, clipped Aryan look that's um, both alluring and frightening. Um, obviously, well, you see the connection, perhaps. This is a portrait from photograph, a commissioned portrait of uh, Winston Churchill from 27 in the National Portrait Gallery, uh, Hugh Walpole uh, from 29 in the Glasgow Art Gallery and Museum, the Viscount Castle Ross from 1935, probably pronounced that wrong. These noblemen's names are always hard to pronounce. And some of you may have seen the poster, the flyer for this lecture. Uh, you know different politics informing uh, Toyman's portrait of Mwanda Kitoko of 2000, a painting from a series exploring the, the horrors of uh, late Belgian colonialism, and um, Sickert's uh, rather adulatory portrait of the soon-to-abdicate uh, King Edward the uh, Eighth. You might say it's just a, a rather formally whimsical and superficial juxtaposition of images, all of which all they have in common is that they're tall and they have um, uh, men in uniforms in them. Um, but um, in my striving to make Sickert seem contemporary, it's good enough for me. Here's a photograph of Beaverbrook, and you see how it's transformed with other sources, obviously, into the, the final painting. This is the arrival of Amelia Earhart. So Sickert um, Sickert recycling the news to make history painting. Um, um, getting at modernity. This is the airplane that's arriving in the rain, umbrellas. Um, it's, um, it's a kind of very modern design, but at the same time it's using pictorial plastic means that are in the 1930s sort of old hat as well. So it's um, it's uh, within its period, a very curious image. But great art lives beyond its period. The image takes on new potency, new meanings. This is the uh, source photograph from which uh, the painting derives. And here um, is Sickert at a Buckingham Palace garden party. That's Sickert there. But clearly, the loner who loved the crowd, um, the bustle of crowds, it's, it's not maybe for the, it's not a uniquely 20th century modernity, but modernity is older than the 20th century, so to speak. So it, modernity really, our experience of modernity, something that goes back to the 19th century. And so these, these throngs of people of different social status mixed in a certain situation, happy to be a melange, um, is, I think, an aspect of a certain modernity. Lady Berwick in her coronation robes. There's a portrait of Lady Berwick. So this is uh, uh, Peggy, Ash Peggy again, Peggy Ashcroft. Um, notice the similarity to my little Gwen Franson Davis painting of this love for, well, this is, of course, the original photograph, but this very pallid, in pallid profile against a dark ground and with Robeson as, as Othello, colored Othello, the headline declaims in 1930. There's the painting that comes from it. These are the equivalent, the British equivalent of the Radio City Rockettes. They're called the, the Tiller Girls. Um, 
and they're, they're high-stepping um, chorus girls who do a sort of variation on the can-can. Um, and uh, here's the, an art English girls know best is the headline from this press photograph transformed by Sickert here. So the contemporary photograph, a taboo still, I mean, in Britain in the 30s, um, to, to, you know, it's David Sally 20 or, it's, it's David Sally 40 years early, isn't it? 50 years early to be um, recycling illustrations. But I suppose also, of course, it's Picabia. Um, but so the other thing that he draws from besides the contemporary photograph is the 19th century um, illustration. Now, his father had been, Sickert's father was a, he was born in Munich, by the way, of a Danish father and English mother. And his father um, was a ne'er-do-well illustrator, but quite a talented one, and sort of connected to a whole slew of very, very extraordinary um, British uh, illustrators for magazines like Punch. Uh, this is John Gilbert, The Unexpected Rencontre, published in the Illustrated London News. And this, um, remember, this is the mid 20th century. In the mid 20th century, anything Victorian was viewed with utter disdain and disgust. The, the Euston Arch would later be pulled down to make way for a, a brutalist train station because it's Victorian and who needs that? So it's, it's um, uh, to the modern movement, ornament is crime. Um, rather in the way that Rodin in the 19th century had the audacity to rediscover the Rococo, so Sickert in the 20th century um, insisting on the Victorian um, is to be seen in the, his day as ridiculously old-fashioned, but after the event as a sort of pioneer in a rejigging or reformulation of taste. And so, so this becomes this. Um, Summer Lightning 31 to 2 uh, in, the, uh, in, in Merseyside. Perhaps John Lennon saw this. And here is another of those paintings derived from um, sort of tacky kitsch somewhat, uh, but to Sickert's mind, rather accomplished uh, uh, paintings, uh, sorry, illustrations of the 19th century. And these, these late works were the most um, problematic and disdained of Sickert's late earth, and they were called his echoes. He called, him his, he called them his echoes. And um, you could pick them up for pff, not very much money until quite recently. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. But uh, as Jackie Mason says, every Jew could have bought a building. But um, Sirens Abroad, 1937. So he's I said David Sally, but really he's like a Richard Prince, well ahead of his time, except for Richard Prince. Ironically, once it's been done already, it can look fresh. But when you're doing it at the wrong moment, a bit too early, it looks stale until it becomes fresh, thanks to the later person making the earlier fresher. Do you follow that? Yes. <laughs> so... The alienations of modern life um, and, and the infatuations. The, the, that's a sort of strange mix, which I think is what makes him so contemporary, so appealing to a Toymans or to a Hannah or to others. This is a, a late painting of the Temple Bar um, in London, squared up, um, suggesting it is from uh, a drawing, but it's not. It's from a photograph that was also squared up. Um, his uh, a painting called Easter, with all these hats in the window of a department store, Dawson's and Brothers. Uh, this is in the Ulster Museum in Belfast. And this is a painting by Merlin James, which I just whipped off the internet, and I don't know its title. Isn't that disgusting? But um, it's from the 80s, and James is a young, well, as she is older than me, but 
does that, can he still be young? Um, yes. Merlin James is an artist um, with whom I share a great passion for Sickert and Durand, and I'm still working out in my own mind whether my great admiration for Merlin James derives from his admiration from Sickert and Durand, or the other way around, and to some reason the archaeology of my own taste formation has become too obscure to me to work it out. But um, as I say once again, that's not your problem. But you can, I think, see in Merlin James a great affinity. Here's a Sickert, latish, a late Sickert painting of Dieppe, the town that, in, 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 that he discovered in northern France in the um, 1890s and went back to very frequently. Incidentally, one of the key Ripper murders, he's recorded to have been in Dieppe eight hours before the murder took place in London. Um, but Patricia Cornwall, who travels everywhere by helicopter, feels that's not an obstacle to his getting in place, knife sharpened for the deed. Here's a painting of Bath from 39 to 40, and here's another of those Sickert-like, but also Thomas Jones-like um, architectural fragment paintings by James. And James, I feel, when I look at James, I look at Sickert, I feel that there's both, and Hannah as well, a kind of romance about painting, but also a strenuous kind of, there's a strenuous romance, there's a romance strenuously trying to cloud a certain alienation from the means of painting, but nonetheless, the alienation gives a kind of energy to the romance. Here's a detail of a Sickert painting uh, from 1905, the kind that fans of Walter who don't like Richard um, would, would really set, set apart as being Sickert at his exquisite best. Merlin James, uh, painting from a photograph um, on the right. On the left, I've just thrown in, it's from grab the slide from another lecture I was giving about painting and photography, and it's Gerhard Richter, but um, not bad that it's here, because we're thinking about the whole, the whole process, the proto-pop nature of, um, uh, and also the conceptual implications of late Sickert for painting in, in Europe of the post-war period. Here's a Merlin James painting uh, derived from um, one of the Alinari brothers' 19th century photographs, uh, which he became so excited by. This is the work of a young artist named, he is young, Greg Lindquist. Um, it's called Decay of Industry, Industry of Decay. And um, I uh, got to know Greg a few years ago, and. Uh, he won't mind me saying, I took great pleasure in introducing him to the work of Sickert, and, because, and also Muirhead Bone, um, who'll have to wait for another lecture. But um, just to say that these affinities it doesn't have to be, as with Toyman's discovering Sickert later in his um, development, it's just wonderful that these artists are there to be discovered as, aha, someone else was doing something like me at some point. The post-industrial Lindquist obviously looks closely to Whistler um, via Rackstraw Downs perhaps, but I think of uh, Greg as being sort of Whistler form with sickert, late sickert colour, the kind of strange, uh, the sickly beautiful strange um, synthetic palette of late sickert. What is that humming? Okay. If it's on the street, it's authentic. So to wrap up, we've talked about um, alienation. Let's have a few more words about infatuation. Of course, going back to my own um, personal as opposed to professional interest in Sickert as an artist um, who precipitated my interest in images of actresses, images, of, images rooted in infatuation. He formed, late in his life, he's a great 
a great uh, lady, ladies' man, Sukkot, had three marriages. And um, if, if we exclude the prostitutes he's alleged to have sent their way, uh, the ladies he's recorded to have met all found him exceptionally charming. Um, and, and they include Virginia Woolf, who luckily for literature was not one of his victims, and wrote a rather touching monograph about him. And um, uh, so Gwen Franson Davis, a young actress from Wales who was a star of the uh, 30s, played Juliet to uh, John Gilgood's debut, Romeo, um, uh, had a sort of platonic liaison with Sickert. They would meet at St Pancras Station for tea, and um, Sickert sort of became um, a respectable stalker of, uh, of, of Gwen's, um, m making many paintings of her. This is called Gwen Again, and is in the collection of Brian Ferry. Um, and this is uh, Gwen, Miss France, Gwen France and Davis as Isabella of France, otherwise known as La Louve, the, the wolf S. Um, uh, and it's from 1932 and is in the Tate. And uh, I came just recently upon a trove on the internet of uh, Gwen, Gwenobilia and uh, want to share with you precisely the kind of uh, press photographs that would have. Uh, uh, enthralled Sickert. Here's uh, Gwen as Cleopatra in Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra from 1925. There she is with Gilgud, not in Romeo, not in Romeo and Juliet, but in uh, Richard uh, Gordon Davio's Richard of Bordeaux. And that's, I think, the role that's captured in... No, no, La Louvre is from Richard II, Shakespeare. No, no, not Shakespeare, uh, Marlowe, but this is a different play. Anyway, enough theatre trivia. More to the point, here is my little picture, and on the right, I actually found this on the internet and was able to buy it from some theatre memorabilia dealer. The, uh, the souvenir from the Barretts of Wimpole Street... Uh, which is the play that Gwen is appearing in, and I think this is probably the very photograph from which this little pride of joy of mine is derived. So just that thing about infatuation, if we're trying to make Sickert seem contemporary, an obvious touchstone would be that great mm, melancholy explore, uh, that that, that artist of melancholia, infatuation, and celebrity culture, uh, Elizabeth Payton um, on the left, Princess Elizabeth's first broadcast on the right, Prince William at the Queen Mother's birthday, 2001. Um, um, like Payton, Sickert is um, a very great devotee of the House of Windsor. Here is, uh, well, pre-Windsor, of course, Queen Victoria and her great-grandson, circa 1936, a small, uh, an, oil, an oil painting in the Tate. Um, that we've talked about already. And there is the man we've been talking about with his wife, Therese Lesore, photographed by Cecil Beaton. Excellent. Thank you.